Great, it started. So, um, so data, like, so in the CRISP DM uh, framework, the reason why, the, you know, people deliberately think about frameworks in many ways is because sometimes guidance is important. Like some people just think the, the value is on like morally. But, but that kind of framework puts it like after really these people, you know, studying different companies, industries, whatever, whatever, in the 1990s already, they understood one has to really understand the business first to really make an impact. And most failed projects are because they, don't, they didn't understand the business to start with. And they probably went into just data exploration. Um, and then they kind of like after a while, they realize that and then they spend time. You know, in, in industry wise, what you really see is there's nothing for fun. Everything, every inch of like, even if you are fine, you don't mind wasting your time, but the company really considers that one their expense because each of your hour and your minute is built, right? And so whether it's small or big, but it's built and they want to get from each cent an amount, some kind of value. And when you are not doing that, you're basically costing the company. When you are repeating one task twice, you're actually asking the company for the same product to pay twice, right? So the company from the industry perspective in the mentality perspective, it's just they want you to be superhuman and know everything in the beginning, do it once and just done. Because that way, then you will just, they will give you another task, another task, another task. Of course, from your side, it's fun to do some things, to learn, blah, blah, which is important. But that's exactly why mentality is, it is not about fun for you. It's not about like, uh, you know, how much you know, whatever. It's about how, how much value you give and the company has goals and how much you help it to have goals. So in this case, exploration, if you just did some cleaning and then go to exploration and use the, original data, you basically wasted your time, right? So it's like in a way that, why did you do that in the first place? You must do it because it has a purpose. It has a purpose towards the goal, to answer a certain question. So the cleaning was necessary for basically to, to not deal with it again, not to deal with it again or to, to discard it. There's nothing learning here. I think I, I keep seeing you are, of course, you came from the university and you have a university mentality. And I keep seeing in every, in many of you, there is no learning. Like we don't care, like um, about your knowledge. I mean, to be honest, it's like we we really care about how prepared you are for a job, and that's what distinguishes us from another any other competitor. Is that it isn't we don't give you anything for learning. Like if it is just only for learning, we just say like you know that's not us. That's not us doing. Just maybe do and get it somewhere else. For us, every task, every effort, every time you do must relate to whether you will be job ready or not. So, so that means I don't want you to just learn something. Like I want you to think whether each of your time is used to answer a certain question and that is kind of displayed in your portfolio. So that means if you do uh, cleaning twice, you wasted, you wasted our time. Basically, we are now your client or your, you know, your company that you're working. So the more you do something just for learning, the less we become relevant. Like it's kind of in that analogy, of course, I'm, I'm stretching it. I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating it to show you that what we care is that you understand the principles, what makes you productive at a job environment and that you don't do something like for the sake of, you know, learning. It's for the sake of production towards a goal. Does that make it clear like to everyone? Because this is a key, key, key element. And I want you to you know, repeat it. I don't mind saying it again and again when you ask me, but I, I, ask, I, hope, you to, I hope to know that you understand that point clearly. Elias, what did? Okay, yeah, I understand that point. But my question was like, I'm using the clean data on data exploration, but the clean data has like, for example, the outliers removed from it. So like on the exploration, should we sh be showing the outliers or they shouldn't be shown on the exploratory sector? What, what do you think it should be? 
So Sometimes based on what I answer, uh, based on what I said, what do you think it should be? Sometimes it can be a little bit informative to have those outliers, like to know about the data. But most of the time, I don't think they are that important. I mean, that's really the point. In a sense that it is you who determined how, based on your time, based on everything, how much to investigate them more, right? Because they are outliers, they are data points. If you don't understand them, if you just throw them, you're throwing an information, probably the most important information. For example, if you are doing fraud detection and you throw outliers, you basically are left with nothing because the outliers are actually the frauds, right? So it is you then who determined how, you know, based on everything uh, available, time is important. For example, if, if outliers are kind of like, exceptions that you you should understand them later and you don't have time because you have to deliver to a company the trend then basically i would say yeah okay maybe just for now you don't care about the outliers you, you you kind of just put them in the side for future analysis and you kind of go on um, and analyze but for full understanding definitely you have to it's an iterative process that means you can't just do something go there and just forget the previous one right even for modeling, when you model, you have to go back to analysis, uh, feeling the missing values differently and all that. Okay, thanks. But it's just that model the same, but because it helps you um, make a point. Never you? If anyone had before their hand, can you show it again as well? So, um, uh, then okay. we go. It's still open, yes, for question. Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, my, my suggestion or question is, uh, if you can prepare for us uh, a tutorial on code structure like code imports, code logging, things like that, because I think we are having issues with those concepts. Um, so the, the part, so we gave you the structure, right? The first week. So the structure, uh, folder structure at least. Yes. In Git, right? So that it should have that, it should have that. And another thing we say is that we gave you also like what we use, it's called PEP8. So that's like a Python's definition. Like exactly like if you just search, you know, PEP8, uh, then style guide for Python code. And that is the definition that every Python person uses. So like, for example, you can just go and check it here. And we, in, some, in some of our challenges, we actually gave you, but that's the definition. So like, even there are codes that will ch just check that. So like, you know, uh, I think it's flag eight, for example, or there are many who would even automatically check that, that you are, following that guideline because python is a very very you know well taught language that means if people or the organization has defined what is the good way and there is also on top of that the uh, uh, it's called i think the zen of python or so that's basically the definition just like in software engineering what you have like the what is called some definition um like then here in python you have the zen of python just 10, 10 kind of principles that you shouldn't repeat yourself, should be clear, there should only be one way to do it, blah, 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 blah. But PEP8 is just our guideline. That means it has everything from code layouts, string quotes, comments, naming convention, uh, recommending you know, function annotations, variable annotations, and all that. Yeah? Maybe does that answer Thanks. your... Your, yeah. okay. okay. So everything from logging to everything that's just a style related to style, how you code a class, you know, what you use and all that is defined there and or in related items. Um, okay, so Elias, did you, did you also, was your question answered? Yes. Great. Okay, so uh, just let me open my window because still, like a little bit hot, sorry.
Okay, so now, you know, I always want, I can tell you what is. Like the project and I can describe that, but I sometimes believe, just tell me if it's not um, something that you agree. It is easier if I ask you what do you understand and what you don't understand from the current project. Of course, we will talk a little bit about profit and uh, time series analysis, but I would also like to know like those people who have seen the 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 project description or the challenge description, I want you to ask me like what do you what do you understand? Why don't you understand? Like so that we talk based on that instead of me like going through every detail, which if that's the case, usually it's uniform I'm applying. But then the problem is that most of it you already can understand. But if I spend most of my time actually explaining the part that is not clear, it is much better. Okay, so Robert, for example, tell us about pipelines. So pipelines are, so in this case, he's asking, so this is, uh, you see, like this is the data, right? And, and you know, pay attention here. So this competency is finally was really making and where we put pipe MC3, that means you know, MC3 is major contribution, MC2 is measurable contribution, minor contribution. So wherever we put MC3 and MC2, that means there we really requiring like your competence is going fast at that, like or what you expect your competence. So just make sure that you see this, even if it seems the same, it's not the same. We always change it, okay, uh, to reflect. So for example, by doing the current week, you really get a lot of major contribution in your job readiness in the dashboard visualization sense, and MLOps, uh, modeling and evaluation, and Python programming, as well as also um, in in business understanding, because it's this this part is so critical about understanding business. Uh, and then, of course, a little bit of data understanding. I mean, a, country, a significant one and uh, stuff like that. But and and also just pay attention that how it's graded like in a sense like for example here what we really care in that um so the the 10 points in the end stream are distributed basically for presentations um through like providing insights on point from task 1.1 that you provide so analysis you brought some insight right so in the end stream we really care about that and then that even if you use just one or twice, just try using the log library, like the Python logging, just to give output. And sometimes try to also just, even once, try to use try and catch kind of error, error catching in, in cases that's not. Um, so just, so this is, this is how you can maximize some kind of like, at least, you know, uh, your appearance that you actually pay attention and then, of course, that you present it clearly um, in, the, in the entry sense. And in the uh, final sense, we, of course, care always. You, we want you to just put out your stuff. Like, whatever you do, we want you to publish it somewhere. Because that's what's called pro portfolio. And that's what makes you different from other people. Because it's not only for us. We don't, you know, it's us is just to it. But also to the world, that to your peers, you know, to everybody else, so that they see that you cannot fake those kind of things because it takes time. And if you do it more, they know that, okay, definitely you have been active, right? So that's why in your Git, the activities we really require it is because you can't just fake a Git activity. You can't fake publications, like because you must have taught at least that time. So we really push you to output everything that you have usually just in some place, at least LinkedIn, Medium, uh, and and your own probably blog in Git um, in Git pages, so some kind of evidence that you have actually published something or you are submitting it that will give you some point. And of course, that you write. We ask you every report. We want it to be closer, so we don't want you to double write it. So the report and the the kind of that what you put out for a blog is more or less similar. So that's like still the clarity. 
and the professionalism that the plots are not distorted, you know, like they, they, you don't have too much spelling mistakes, fonts are the same and well produced and balanced between being full of information and easy to understand, just, you know, like the part. And in the uh, technical point, in the GitHub, again, of course, this is just really, we want you to do a lot more object-oriented uh, one. And when you plot, you plot with care, not just like plot something, you know, without labels, without thinking about the quality, without the figure size change. We want you to actually think always your default is actually good enough. So for example, always just have a code that you will call always to plot such that it takes care of the image size, it's not small, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then try, try it also just the unit testing. Even if it's a few parts of the code, try to write a unit test in it. Um, even if, you know, you have one or two of your course, major course are tested, uh, you, you, you will just get it. Like the thing is, we want you to just think about it sometimes. And then already we assume that you have set up um, DVC and ML flow, so we just, we, assume, we ask you to use it again here, right? So that you just get again the screenshot for DVC and ML flow with the current data. So that would give you, you know, just that without any task from just last, last week, because you set it up, now you get some value um, out of it. And then in the final one, you actually, of course, uh, that you implement the CLGit uh, workflow, you created a branch and you get a pool, so you get some kind of uh, really CICD kind of uh, pipeline. And then um, the CML report, when you get push the code, you get something. So for all that you get, because we really focus, we, we, we want to, we will use it again and again. So we want you to be just concrete here. And then the other part is, the ML models you will implement is seven points, and then the deep learning will have um, 10 points. And then if you deploy your code, you will get eight, but if you couldn't deploy, but you have only a screenshot of the dashboard that you produce, you get half, but you know, that's, that's it. So coming back to the instructions, so there is one part where we say a pipeline, right? So there's a process thing. So, Pipelines are really just nothing more, but it's like instead of writing one by one the code, for example, you call classifier or you call like a regressor and you kind of code it, blah, blah, and then you do again, um, you call, you write sub separately the function for, um, you know, hyperparameter optimization, this and that, but a pipeline is more or less one class. It is, you could have write, uh, you write it yourself, but Scalar also has a pipeline, which you basically chain it. So the different things that usually appears in chain, that means first you pre-process, second, you do some kind of like filtering, third, you do some kind of um, kind of modeling, testing, hyperparameter optimization, all these are chained. So it's kind of a chain that connects. So with a simple code with one or two lines, you connect all those pieces of work. So the pipeline is basically like that. In every place, I just start from a pipeline. If I'm like, um, so for example, this is one form of pipeline. I would just say, like, it's a very simple pipeline, but this is fetch prepared data that I'm, I just shared with you now uh, for the profit. So, you know, it, it, it loads data, but here it does kind of apply pre-filter, apply transform, apply, um, So, and, and there are a number of these kind of pipelines, even for myself, I write. If whatever I do, I will just chain them. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, oh, there are many questions I have not been following. Um, okay, tell us about pipeline. Can you please share your screen? Um, so that has been shared, right? You have been seeing it. And the store data sets contains much less entries. What, so Dimora, like what's your understanding of the store data? H Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, I can. 
Okay. Uh, I've just started with the new task, yeah. and I loaded the stored data set, and it has less columns than the other, I think, yep. and it has less rows. I was thinking the stored data set contained all the training and test data together, but I'm guessing that's not the case because it has less entries. Yeah. So it is basically about the stores, right? It's nothing got to do with yeah. test and train, but it's just a store. For each of the store, the ID, so, so if you look at it, um, so it's basically there are many stores and all of them like so in the actual data you have the store type assortment what is the type of assortment uh, these are additional data on the store so on the so let, let's imagine for you know i don't know how many of you i think there isn't a common um, um supermarket but let's people would know probably walmart like at least they have heard of it so let, let's imagine walmart so walmart doesn't have only one place Right, Walmart is in many places, in many cities, in many whatever. So if you if you have also checkers in your country or some other um, kind of chain of, so each of them will so they have a store. So that store is one store, like because not all stores are also the same. Not all stores are also big. No, so that means this is a, the num the store ID. That means basically physically it has a location. You could imagine this ID corresponds to a longitude or latitude or a place or a, you know, an address. And then the type, the store type tells you what kind of, you know, is it big, is it small, depending on the keyword, right? And assortment is what kind of things they, they hold. Is it like, you know, like the grocery store or is it a medical store? Is it a, some kind of, I don't know, alcohol store? or some kind of thing. And then this competition distance tells you whether there are competitors around, like for that store, like from another brand. So it tells you in distance, in meters, like where is the next one? Because this is very key, right? If you are in an area where there are many uh, competitions, it's kind of, you have very different than if you are like in a rural area, just you are the only one, right? So, mm -hmm. so this is more of about a store. Nothing about the data. It's about what, like the, each store, what is it doing? Like, you know, the, the, or the physical property of a store. Um, while the train and test is basically, um, you know, that's, that's different. That's a train and store is basically, the train and test is basically actually the data what you get, like what you would use for training. And the sample is like what you will output basically. For each of the store ID, you would probably predict for a certain period the sales amount. Okay, that's thank some you. Years. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hopefully that's clear. Okay. A simple definition of the difference between univariate and multivariate time series. I mean, so you stage like the univariate time series is that it has one dependence and one target. So that basically means it's a one-dimensional. Univariate usually means just one-dimensional. So that means in this case, if you are predicting the store, like for a given store across time, so time becomes now the dependent variable, and the sales amount becomes the target variable, then this is univariate. Because for each time, you're basically doing something and you're predicting sales for that time. What about if you have now multiple covariates, like uh, let's say time plus store, you know, that's a multivariate or a bivariate, but multi means more than one. So that could also simplify. So is that clear, Stacey? And usually like, and, you know, multi, when you get multi, it's nice. You only, you only get the only advantage you will have in multivariate is or whatever, every time is that when there is correlations. Because correlations means information. Let's say uh, there is no, you, you, you probably don't have explicit information about holiday, let's say. But now one, one store in another place and another store in another place, both of them sold at that time a lot. So normally 
that is an information that is an information about actually because of the, the unknown the one that correlates them both is actually a holiday but you probably didn't have that information explicitly so you can get more information about that through sometimes multivariate but i would say what we ask you is like you can do multivariate by number number of people customers so you can predict or so you can also independently do univariate for both as well so stage is that clear yeah okay thank yeah. you and no worries uh kate should we merge the train and store data sets for eda sure some some form of like uh it's, it's kind of joining them in such a way that but it might also mean uh, you will have a weeds right which is fine but i think that that will give you some kind of information um especially the distance and all that as a as features now uh, or you can split also if you if you for example want to study based on um it's like a splitting based on, I don't know, equal distances, blah, 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 blah. So that, that's usually, yeah. Merging gives you a much more information. Like that means you, it's just, you, you bring it, you, you make it white, the table, right? So you get information. Kate, is that clear? Yeah, it's, um, um, yes, it is, yes, it is. Okay. And then, okay, so that's answered. Stacey, what kind of time series we are, are we applying? Good question, so that's, so, you can have so many types of time series, but who did time series before? Who can tell me a bit more about time series? What do we mean by time series and what kind of analysis do you know for time series? You know, what, okay, what form of data that I know you're using time series every day, but you might not recognize, but just distinguish from things that you do, time series data, that it, either you become a user of, you know, you generate a time series data um, or used it. Just what example, for example, from your daily alias here? Yeah. Okay, for example, in a speech recognition, we can break the speech into smaller chunks, but every speech in every second has no meaning independently. It depends on the previous data. So we need to somehow consider the previous data in order to have some understanding from the data. So on this case, we use like an LSTM or our, uh, some form of recurrent neural network to yeah. help us understand the meaning. Great. Yeah, that's a bit complex, but let's, let's get to just a very, very basic time series. What is like, what kind of time series data do you know? Yes, uh, one in twelve. Yeah, Christian. Yes, uh, in epidemiology, we have to use most of the time time series data. Absolutely. Yeah, even COVID is a time series data. And weather, is like climate. I mean, just the temperature, humidity, blah blah is time series. Facebook, you know, it's like like your story is time series. Email. Um yeah, so it's definitely exactly what is yeah, data that varies with time. That's a very good definition. Exactly. That means that see a particular time periods or intervals. That's like exactly another one. So time series could be as the main said, it could just be like you know, an interval data. So sometimes you sample it only with an interval, sometimes it's continuous, for example, a sensor sending like what it's sensing it's just maybe more continuous like maybe even within seconds your mobile for example always uses continuously a time series data your uh, gyroscope in the in the uh, in the mobile in the device or your i don't know like when you rotate your your screen it's it's the screen change that's a time series data right because it continuously monitors the sensor which is in this case the accelerometer and the gyroscope it kind of tries to to see the orientation of the uh, phone right or the the kind of the brightness it, it deems or not based on light that's again a time series data if you just record it that's a time series data so there but the time series data is just basically anything that is 
exactly that can be measured in different um, timestamps or you know, intervals or continuous uh, cases. So that is what is time series. In this case, our time series is somehow dependent on the date, right? So that means we are recording. We could have recorded for every single person uh, across time. If we had a customer, like if we had more information, we could have even just a time series of a, a given customer, right? So that would become like, but as Semaine, for example, said here, what we do is that we don't care about actually the individual customer, but we kind of average it in such a way that it is per day for a store. So a store becomes a, an index, and for a store at a given day, the amount of sale. So now it's time and sale with just, you know, four different uh, stores. That basically becomes our time series data. So and what kind of, uh, so what we are asking you, there are many things you could have used, uh, but what we are asking you to use, and just I, I provided a very small startup is uh, Facebook Profit. So the Profit is basically, a, you know, if you have done curve fitting, so that's that's a kind of a curve fitting, um, like you kind of, this is the data that you have. Um, and that data is kind of like, um, so I have to change some of the things because I imported them um, from some other work. Uh, 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 this is, So, so for example, here I am. I am kind of. I gave you just this profit. So the easiest way to understand profit is I also there are you can search it, um, but there is also re, in the reading material. I I provided the the kind of very well detailed. Um, document that de describes the profit. It's a Python package produced by Facebook. Facebook uses it to predict your next thing, right? So it's like whatever, you know, the, your engagement next will, it, or the amount of engagement they will get in a day in a given post, they will forecast it through this. It's a large scale, like, you know, it's paralyzed and it does so much. So it's it's kind of like a way to, it's, it's a kind of fitting. So, you have to distinguish between curve fitting and model. Who can tell me curve fitting versus model? So who has done curve fitting? And what do you understand? Let's, let's take even COVID, OK? So a lot of the predictions that you have seen, so most of them were curve fitting. And some others were models, proper models. So what is the distinction between the two? Anyone? You know, try, don't, don't worry. I, I don't assume that you know, and therefore I, I'm not expecting exact answers or you know, an answer. anything that that you understand or you kind of think it is? Uh, let me correct. Yeah. Um, and the models, uh, when you do a model, for example, you train it, then you use it to predict uh, new values according to uh, some values that you have. But in car fitting, you have, for example, uh, you have maybe a series showing how a line is fitting certain data, and then you, you if you want a new value, you just place it along the line to get the corresponding value that you want to predict. That's what I think. It is good. Maybe my question is actually misleading. What I mean is because even kind of fitting is a model, but what I mean is 
a curve fitting model that's much more of exactly fitting the data versus kind of uh, inspired from something else, not by just the data points, but it actually models some other phenomena. For example, if it's climate, you can get the temperature points and you may have a curve fitting model. The other one is that you model rain, blah, 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 comes from a certain thing and you measure some other information, you relate it, you will have a highly motivated, it could be a physics model, it could be like a you know, blah, blah model, and you have physics in it, biology in it, blah, blah, and then you kind of, based on that, it's called, uh, it has information about like, it kind of, the components, you will understand them better. Like, so in this, like for example, COVID, the COVID curve fitting one is that, Every day you get a case number, right? The number of people that are infected or the number of people who died out of COVID. And then if you collect for like, you know, 10 days, you might curve fit it. Oh, it's rising. It's exponential, blah, blah. So then you fit an exponential model. That is called... Um, exactly. So in that, in the what Simon said, for example, one is just you basically fit the data you don't care it could be like animals it could be people it could be climate you don't care you use the same thing like it doesn't matter because it doesn't have internal knowledge where the data generation comes from so it doesn't take into account the generation the data generation so that means it doesn't try to model the different components while uh, while and actually for example for the covid case if you assume Ah, people, the, the kind of the distance between people is increasing, there is this demonstration, blah, blah, blah. So SIR model, for example, you apply some kind of compartmentalized model where you say uh, people who are not infected, who people who are kind of most likely to be infected and people who are infected and how they change in time based on a certain dynamics that you get from measuring, I don't know, people's behavior. That's kind of a proper kind of component model, compartmentalized model in this case. So that is what is called like, so that kind of modeling, you cannot use, for example, a COVID SIR model, you cannot use it to Rosman. While a curve fitting model, it doesn't matter. You can use it because it's curve fitting. You can use it for Facebook, you can use it for Rosman, you can use it for COVID, you can use it for anything time series because it doesn't care about where the data comes from. It only cares the relationship between time and the, the target variable. Is that clear? So it's not true, it's just only uh, one point. It can be multivariate, it doesn't need to be, but it's just that it doesn't have any information. It doesn't tell you why something is like, why it's increasing or why it's decreasing, because it's just, it increased, it decreased. It has no, uh, knowledge of what happened. It only tells you the data just seems to show this and then you can predict based on this trend we expect the data will go down but a current fitting could be absolutely wrong because maybe tomorrow there's a holiday. It doesn't, I mean, unless you actually add of course a holiday effect. So that's what Prophet is doing. It adds some known components called seasonalities like so it, it tries also to predict seasonality. It tries to, pre, uh, to incorporate change points. It tries to, you know, so it's, it's a bit more com complex, but it's still kind of fitting because it doesn't, doesn't care what it is. It's just a general time series modeling um, uh, package, okay? So if you read this one, what's really important is that, uh, so you have the modeling, visual inspection, and surface problems, and then you, you forecast evaluation, and then you, you model. And the most, so this is kind of, it doesn't care. So it tries to only integrate, gives you the potential to add seasonality in it, and the trend, you can have periodic changes. Uh, maybe you can introduce even some, some regular impacts or even promotions as a, as a form of something. So this is the kind of the... Um, why it's, it's kind of very well known because in, in, in Facebook, weekends are very different from the weekdays, nights are different from days. So it's kind of, it tries to incorporate all those type of um, features, right? So 
But the most important thing is that what is its model? What's its equation? The equation in profit is this, you know, equation one. So it is, it is a, it's a sum of multiple components. The first component is GT, that means a trend function. It only looks at the overall trend of the data. The second part is ST, represents a periodic change, so weekly and yearly seasonality. So, and then the third one, HT, represents the effect of holidays, which occurs on potentially irregular um, schedules. So that means anything that holiday, you know, or some kind of like um, uh, promotion, things like that, you know, you don't have seasonality or predictability. So you incorporate all that type of things on this one, and anything that's periodic, that's, you know, things that are in time periodic, that is weekly, yearly, monthly, on this one, and GT, which is just the overall trend. Like, is it sales, is it increasing or decreasing, for example, over time? And then E is just the error, anything that represents, like, changes which are not accommodated by the model. Okay? So, this is the most important part. Basically, this, if you understand this, you understand. And each of them, of course, are complex. They are modeled in a complex way, but this is what Profit is doing. And for the trend model, they have this function. It's, the, it's basically a nonlinear saturating growth function. Uh, basically, it's like the same as uh, you, can, uh, you, you can model anything from linear to exponential uh, one grows, like as it's just a trend, so negative, positive. And yeah, so if you read it, and then the linear trend change points, um, that's a trend, and seasonality, it's modeled as a cosine, a sine and cosine, it's basically as a Fourier modes, number of uh, modes. Um, and then holidays and events are kind of modeled as some kind of indicator functions, with each of them kind of uh, incorporated as a, as a Gaussian component. And then the model fitting happens this way, um, basically then the results. So read them. So these are each of the components, um, their contributions into the model, right? So this is really details you everything that you need to know. And then this gives you, like this, I just made it simple for you so that you get like at least this class that just transforms something and you can apply a lot of things. But then in the, like here is also like how you model including different prior scales, you know, seasonality, early, daily, blah, blah, which then, you know, gives you also just a plot when you do that. It tells you the trend, it, it predicts, uh, it kind of plots the trend, the weekly, daily, and, and, and monthly it changes, and it shows you its prediction because it splits also the data into uh, 0 0.5 in this case. And um, I'm using some kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's here you would, you would see that the train blah blah is split is 0 0.8 so that means 80 percent is uh, blah blah so you would see just this is like how it fits and the different the historic fit uh, the predictions real test data and as well as also the 80 percent the confidence interval that it has you know it's your point is to really understand and get good prediction out of it just out of curve fitting so one part is curve fitting this one seasonality tastes you know incorporating holidays whatever the next one is that you actually model it you try to predict based on uh, machine learning which is boosting and random forest and the other one the third one that you will do is um using deep learning and then you can you are able to compare so deep learning and um, um so deep learning and machine learning they really are modeling a bit more complex than curve fitting because curve fitting, you all, you have to specify what you model. In in while in a for example boosting, you really don't. You basically just try to incorporate, get as much information as possible with complex relationship between different features. Here, for example, we are not using features, right? So we are only using time and the the point. But you are losing by doing that. You are losing information. But in, in machine learning and deep learning, you're actually incorporating all of those variables, what might even influence. So that's a multivariate fitting. So you're probably getting information about its store type, its kind of assortment, its many, many other details, its distance to uh, other competitions. 
all that is included if it's a boosting, for example, in the trees that you build, right? In the decision trees you build, and then kind of you boost them. And in deep learning, the different complex relationships. So you will see, of course, that you know, sometimes this is so nice, it's easy, it's very fast. You can do millions and billions of lines of rows, uh, predict based on line fitting you know, very quickly, while the other one is slow to train, but uh, in prediction time, it's, it's easier. So it is shared for you in the Google folder, this one, as a starter. Almost it has everything, basically, but you, run, you, you have to understand it. You have to make sure that you predict for different components um, and improve it and show us. So that's what I mean earlier as well. Like, this is the, your default plot should be just like that. It should just have axes that are visible, that are kind of like clear and colors are kind of appropriate and stuff like that. Um, that's what's like always, you should always just, even if it's like your first go, if you have used already another code before, just use that, um, you know, to make your plots usually appear good because they, it's, it's a good default. Okay, so I'll stop there. And if there is any question, I will, um, I will answer. How is it? Is it too much? Is it exciting? Just what do you feel? Do you feel it's overwhelming? Or is it just great? I think this is good. Now we will go and, and do it. What is your feeling? Are you understanding the bigger picture? You have two ways to respond. One is to type, the other one is to raise hands, or the other one is just one you can say. Nathanael. Okay, uh, thank you. For me personally, it's kind of uh, very overwhelming in everything because uh, I've been trying to see the first uh, uh, part of it and uh, understanding even what each tasks or bullet points wants to do uh, is something I need to work on. So I'm hearing about this time series thing and about all these models and everything. Everything new seems uh, very overwhelming and a little okay. bit scared. I see that it's, it feels overwhelming for people. The, the thing is that you have the code now, like even if, I mean, that's basically it, like except just with small tasks, right? It's the understanding. And also remember, this is really, you can work together and kind of understand. And if you want a request for another tutorial, you can ask me like, okay, tomorrow can we talk again? Like just we have question. Now we have a time that to see it, but can we have also another call just to ex So use this opportunity. We are here to really try to make it as much as possible for you to kind of, okay, it's overwhelming, it's too much. And then you see it and then like, ah, okay. Of course, if you really see it in, in the way that I see it, it's not overwhelming. Because what is it? There are three types of ways people do model in real world. One is they just don't care about what it is, the relationship, the complexities, and the correlations. That's curve kind of fitting. It's fast, and you, I should just know it. And there's another part which is like, which takes into account machine learning, for example, is takes to account the relationships but it doesn't also learn about how the data is represented. So I'm, I'm talking now more depth, but like machine learning doesn't care, does, you have to give it your representation. So that means it will only learn based on how you represent it. So you represent it in a column way, it learns only in the column way and the relationship, because that's only, so it, it learns from the value. And then there's deep learning, which not only learns like the relationship, the complex relationship, but also learns the representation because it, it is independent of representation as well. So it, it forms its own representation. So there are these types of modeling, like, right? Of course, the, the, each of them, you can do your PhD on, right? They are complex in their own. So it's overwhelming if you think you have to understand. But the point is, uh, did I, do I understand the strategy? Always think of from my side or from our side. What are they trying to tell us? Why is this all? Like, if you're just seeing it as pieces, each of them, 
I tell you that's overwhelming because yeah, like every day we are changing, right? Every week we are changing because it seems so many pieces, but see it from as a whole piece. It's like, you know, get away from this just detail view, like that you are like there and you count every single action that you have to do. A little bit, take your time and, and just pull off yourself and see it's like the, the kind of averaged version. So the averaged version means like, what are they really, what is their strategy? You know, why are they giving us this? Okay, one part is automation. So we're like, we have to do this ML ops, blah, blah. That's a part where maybe it's more of to make it stable, predictable, maintainable. And there's another part, which is kind of modeling aspect. And there is a, a kind of data related source like, and then there's another aspect of like deploying and reporting and portfolio, blah, blah. So we have these three components. And we're sampling from each of them and giving you. If you look at just only the samples, it's overwhelming. But if you really see it from like, okay, this three perspective, the, it gets simpler because now you only see three stuff. There's a modeling aspect of different complexity. I will learn over time in the future. There is a deployment and communication and, um, you know, com kind of portfolio perspective. And then there is a part of like exploring data, blah, blah, perspective, right? So whenever something is overwhelming, always try to remove yourself from that view and find another view that makes it less overwhelming. Because overwhelming means you have many components you cannot monitor and handle. You know, it's like if you have many pieces that you have to take care of, that's overwhelming. So that means what is the easiest way to go out of overwhelming state? To go to, to look at it not that close, but to look at it slightly a bit far forward. Then you see pattern. If you see pattern, then the brain knows how to remember, like because it's, it kind of puts everything in a category, in a pattern. And then you can come closer to one part of only. You do that part, you do that part, you do that part, right? That's my strategy. Always when something is overwhelming, it means the number of pieces are many that your brain is not remembering. Your brain can only remember six things at a time. That's why phone numbers are like six or seven numbers. Right? After that, you, if I tell you 2567, you remember that. You can repeat it. If I say 2567, 64, now it's okay. You can remember. But if I now add one even number, seven, it's like, 25, 63, 44, five, already by the time you, you, you hear five, you're losing the first point because your cache, your memory is not hand, you know, suitable for handling that many um, parts. So overwhelming means that the number of pieces you need, your brain needs to take care are many. That means you need to change your point of view and maybe just get out from that view and try to reduce the numbers that you have to take care of. So it was 50, now reduce it to three. There's a modeling blah, blah aspect. There is communication and writing and automation aspect. Uh, no, so let's call it just the automation part and predict, being predictable, being kind of like, you know, uh, useful and reliable. One aspect, which is like ML ops, CL, blah, blah, CICD, everything in one part and the communication and kind of reporting business understanding the other part and modeling and data in the, in the set part. So this is the three component then. Then you can look each of them separately. Each of them may have their own, again, three, four component like that. If it's hierarchical, the overwhelming nature will disappear. So hopefully that will give you a trick how to not get overwhelmed by anything else. But as I said, use us you know, you have the best chance that you can use, you can tell us because we are very highly invested in you to be good. We'll do anything in our power to make you less overwhelmed, more kind of fast learn and, and get ready. So use that opportunity, don't forget that. So awesome guys, so let's stop here and whatever questions, uh, rocket chat. Cheers, bye.